Hi, everybody. This is a wee bit of alchemy. I'm Rick Barrett. Welcome. And I, we've got a grab bag of things that we want to uh, to explore. So I'd like to uh, dive into one of them right off. And that was to go back over and and dig in a little deeper into the idea of feeling and doing and and being able to distinguish between the two because they are two very different parts of your nervous system. The motor function is the doing part, and that's the efferent part. That's the, and that's where signals go from your central nervous system and go to your extremities and, and tell your muscles to contract. That's the function of, of a sensory or a, uh, a motor neuron. It says, hey, muscle, contract. And so we get that, uh, uh, we get action where, where the body moves. Um, so that is whenever the command goes out from the central nervous system, hey, do this, that is uh, activates that muscular contraction to make that happen. The sensory part, the feeling part, that is a, uh, that's the afferent neural network. And that takes in um, information from the senses and converts it into signals, I think electrical signals that, that go through the nervous system and go to the central nervous system and then they get sorted out. And, and a, that's just happening moment by moment. So you're getting millions of bits of information coming from your five senses and it goes through the, the different pathways and gets, and as it happens, it starts, weeding out uh, redundant information. And whenever you have a strong enough signal and enough neurons are starting to fire in a certain area and you say, oh, and your body responds to the fact you just sat on a tack or you touch the stove or whatever, so that there's a whole lot of information coming in that, that alerts your central nervous system that something is something's going on. And if it is, an even subtler um, idea that you know a nuance like hmm, what is that smell you know and then now your cerebral cortex is getting involved in the thing and it's starting to compare this and that and it's saying well it's kind of a little bit like cinnamon but more like nutmeg or whatever and so you start to to differentiate between the the subtle sensations there it's still that same sensory information that you um, that you had with, but it then has to go and compare it against past sensory informations and go into your memory bank and start to sort through things and and figure out what what's what. So the uh, most of this information is is being processed at the preconscious level. That is, it is not yet has not yet reached the part where your your mind says, oh. That's a, that is a sensation. So what's happening there is you're being bombarded by all this and only a very tiny part, just a few bits of information per second actually makes it through to the conscious mind so that it's able to say, aha, that was not neither cinnamon nor nutmeg, that was allspice. And you can say, aha, and you get this big thrill from, from having made that recognition, made that differentiation. So the, uh, um, what we're trying to do is turn that thing around so that we can actually determine which sensory if, um, data we are, are actually able to perceive and which um, uh, motor neurons we want to activate so that we can consciously move, but also consciously feel. So we're making a distinction between feeling and doing and being able to say, oh, oh, uh, the, my, the, the action of reaching out with my hand like that is, requires muscular contraction of some sort in order to be able to make that happen. 
But there is a simultaneous feeling that is associated with that because there's information that is being processed. Every, every muscular contraction creates a piezoelectric charge, which then shoots through your connective tissue system and, and alerts every other cell in your body that, hey, arm is going out, deal with it. And so that, that is happening and is being processed at that pre-conscious level. But if we can feel that, then we are able to access different parts of the brain that are usually sleeping. They're, or they're happening you know, be way below our, our, the level of our conscious mind. And when we do that, when we reach over and actually go into that part of the brain that, that is processing that information, cool things happen. We start to shift out of the, the thinky thinky part, the chatterbox of our default mode network, and we move into the space between thoughts. And which is cool in and of itself. And that means that, oh, hey, there's just crickets there. There's, there's nothing there. The, the, the thinker bone has, has been hit on pause, but that's, that's cool in and of itself because then we're able to actually reach that, that thing. But it's actually more of a, an indicator that something else has happened. And that is that you have increased by however much your whole brain coherence. And with that, your whole nervous system shifts into a state of coherence. And with that, other systems within your body also go into coherence, which then creates a whole body coherence, which is kind of cool. And um, it the state that the you know, state of awareness is something which I like to call super consciousness. It's a word that's been around for a long time and, and people use it in various ways, but I, I have a very specific definition that I apply to it. And I like it because it just means above consciousness or something that's beyond, beyond the conscious slash rational mind. And so that's the area whenever it includes both the rational mind, the eye of mind, and also the pre-conscious mind, which is the eye of flesh. And so we get into the eye of spirit. And that's kind of cool because it then correlates to a lot of the information that we receive from various spiritual traditions and, and also personal experience that says, yeah, this is, this is what we're talking about here. So whenever we get to that, learning to differentiate between the feeling and the doing, it, we take over control. And it's something that, that has immediate rewards whenever we do that. So, you know, you can think of it too in terms of touching versus feeling. So when a touch, when I touch something that is a doing, that is a, that is an action, that is a, a that is something where I am um, using my motor function to do that. Whereas whenever I, oh, I feel, then it allows me to connect up to a, a broader range of perceptions whenever I do that and opens up to that super conscious state, which allows me to process information very quickly. I can know without thinking. And it's, it's only because I use a, that term because it's not thinking in the way we conventionally, we conventionally identify thinking, which is that dualistic, this is not that. Um, on the other hand, and we're kind of weighing back and forth and making these fine distinctions. We are actually just immediately able to process information and come up to, to, to an understanding that does not go through the laborious process of, of making these, uh, uh, of watching how the different steps of the of the thinking process go on. Sort of like uh, difference between uh, using an abacus, you know, to make your computation, which is kind of cool. You know, I, I don't know how to do it, but people can do it very fast versus just plugging in uh, into a supercomputer and get the cube root of some, you know, 
digit that is, you know, hundreds of uh, some number that's hundreds of digits long. And so you, uh, you're able to grasp things at a very high level very fast. And, and that's kind of cool. But more importantly, it opens up your other awarenesses. You opens you up to perceptics and that are not just limited to your five senses. So, oh, that's cool. So let's just do a real quick um, exploration. We're going to do more of these in the future, but uh, it's good to, I think, exercise this um, as often as possible so that we can um, we can get the we can make that di distinction and then be able to translate it into our everyday lives much better. So um, I think we did it last time with with the hand on the knee. Let's do uh, the hand on the uh, on the elbow. Okay, maybe we did that too. We'll do the hand on the wrist this time. Okay, so the idea is is you're gonna hold your wrist with your with your hand. So I'm using my right hand. So just grab, use your right hand to hold your left wrist. That'll make it easier for me to talk uh, about this thing. And the idea is we want to be able to distinguish between the perceptor, in this case, you know, one or the other is going to, be, going to be the afferent neural network that we're going to access. And, we're and to do that, you have to be able to distinguish one from the other. You have to be able to kind of quiet one side and, and awaken the other. And this is helpful when we do it left, right, because they're using different sides of the brain. So you're actually learning to create some hemispheric synchronization and differentiation and learning to control your which side of the, of the brain that you want to activate, which is kind of cool for a lot of reasons, which we won't get into right now. So right now, let's just uh, right hand on your left wrist. And so feel your left wrist with your hand. And if you, if you need to, just you can move your, move your wrist around so that it, you can actually sense that with your hand and be able to say, oh yeah, yeah, there's, you're picking up some signal. And as you get comfortable with it, then you become more and more, um, it becomes easier to do it without any kind of motion, but you want to be able to distinguish that and just be able to clearly sense with your right hand. Now feel your hand with your left wrist. And here you might want to give the, hand, the wrist a squeeze or something just to, just to be able to do that so you can actually feel the hand with the wrist. So here we're going on the left side, which is the right side of the brain. And so just by doing that and by sustaining that, for you know, a, a, a non-zero length of time, you start to create new neural pathways and familiarity with those pathways. You're saying, oh, okay, I can do that. So a lot of, a lot of reason the body's um, atrophy is that we just don't use them and we don't, we're not aware. So we tend to, the chi doesn't flow as freely. So I'll go back to feeling uh, your wrist with your hand. So you're feeling with the right hand. So the energy, the information is going is being processed by the left side of your brain. And it doesn't mean that the, that you're not feeling with the, with, um, uh, with your wrist also you are, but it is muted. You're consciously muting that to allow the right hand to have a louder voice in your awareness. Now feel your hand with your wrist. And there may be a temptation to just kind of merge the two and, and just make it a big glop. Resist that urge and make that differentiation because this is how we build muscles in our brain. We actually can consciously control our nervous system, which is kind of cool. Many people feel they're slaves to their nervous system or their brain or their mind or whatever, and you're not. You get to you get to, to drive the bus also, if you like. Okay, now we're gonna shift and go to left hand, right wrist. Feel your wrist with your hand. 
So you're using the right side of your brain with your left hand. And if you feel into that, you may be able to notice activity in your brain and localize that activity in a specific part of your brain. It certainly is a learnable thing. It's a teachable thing. It's something that you can get feedback from, from various electronic gizmos. But you can also, if you just take your, take your time, you can do it. Now we're gonna to shift to feel your left hand with your right wrist. So again, you can move the wrist around if you like, or move, just give it a squeeze to your hand, just so you can make a, a distinction there. And here, we're feeling with the right wrist. So we're using the left side of the brain. It's in most of us, it's, it's um, the mute part of our, actually the left side of the brain is the, is the talky part of, a, of, the, of the brain. So it, it may, you may get feedback from that. Okay, now we're going to distinguish between the doing and the feeling. And you just squeeze, use your left hand to squeeze your right wrist. And this time you're focusing on the doing, you're focusing on the motor function. That is you're moving, you're contracting muscles, you're sending signals via the central nervous system, you're contracting muscles to be able to squeeze your, squeeze your wrist. So your focus is on the doing right now. So now focus on the doing with your left hand and focus on the feeling with your right hand simultaneously. Now move your right wrist so that that's the doing. And you wanna feel that with your left hand. So you're using the motor with the right hand and the, the uh, sensory with your left. Cool. And scene. Okay, so that's the, uh, that, uh, <laughs> Uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Does that does that work for people? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, cool. Stan, do you have something? You will have to speak up, Stan, or turn your oh, he, he sound on. No, he didn't have anything. Oh, didn't have any. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm getting the distinction between the feeling and the action and doing. But when you're feeling, do you have? Uh, how is the uh, feeling uh, away from the uh, what you're feeling or there? I'm not sure about that. I don't understand that question. Okay. When you're, mo uh, you're moving, uh, you're, you could, let's say, I'm applying the pressure. So I, I know that I'm applying a pressure, but when you're just feeling whatever is there, uh, you just and don't do anything other than try to get the uh, information or yes. you have it flowing away from that area. I don't know about flowing away. You just, you're just getting the information from that, from your Just sensors. getting information. Okay. You say, you're, you're, okay. Without a story, without saying, Oh, that feels like pressure or, or that's, uh, Oh, I'm squeezing myself too hard or whatever it is. You're in you know, whatever story, get rid of that. And you're just, you're just re reducing it down to the raw information. Okay. So then, and what that does is it gets you out of the part of your brain that likes to make up stories and goes into this other part, which is processing the information directly. And that, by being able to do both at once, then we're able to function at a much higher level. So that's the, uh, that's, at least, at least that's my theory on this. I don't know, if we'll see what that, uh, we'll see how it goes. I, I, I look forward to hearing your feedback about these things and, and see if it, tell me if it, if it works or doesn't work for that. Lynn. Well, it seems to work if, um, what, I, what I really felt when we were doing this was, just the the brain being like fizzy, you fizzy. Know? fizzy. Yeah, it's like uh, like, yeah, yeah, a little bit of sense of you know 
I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm putting into Prosecco or something up there <laughs> in a very good way. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good, good. Okay. Well, uh, me too. So that's uh, it's, it's good, it's good, good to hear. <laughs> so yes, yes, you can. You can see it, and it's it's nice. I've actually had feedback from various electronic devices that that tell me that no, no, that's not just your imagination, Rick. You're you there's actually something going. You're lighting you're lighting up these lights, you know, with, whenever you do that. So it says yes, okay, good. We're we're on to something. So then we can go forward from there. But that's it's a thing, you know. There's a a, a machine told me that it's a thing. So then that, that <laughs> so My I feel much, I feel very happy about that. Because <laughs> so, if a machine doesn't tell you, then you're not quite sure. But you know, if, if a machine does, yes, you are. So uh, good. So moving on. Um, oh, Valerie. Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, we did do this in Sedona. Um, so there, Rick Myers, you're getting some of Sedona. <laughs> and because we were in a certain environment with everybody, you know, hive mind kind of thing, working at the same thing, you know, awareness being heightened just because of that factor alone. Um, I was I, I was a little surprised that I could sit here and feel the part of my brain that was getting the information. So um, that was way cool. I, I really, uh, yeah, it was it was very good. Excellent, excellent, good, good. So more brain fizzies, so, <laughs> <laughs> more schweppervescence, yay! <laughs> and and it's what what is re, what you're feeling is actual increase of 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 blood flow in your brain. You're it's going. There are studies that are done that indicate that while under stress, that up to 80% of the blood flow in your prefrontal cortex moves to the back of your head. And, hmm. uh, and so you actually reduce your ability when you're heavily stressed, you reduce your ability to differentiate, your ability to think uh, under pressure. So it's a- uh, Is that hence the uh, fight or flight? That is that's part of it, yes. Yeah. So you, you get yeah. into a fight or flight, so you move into the reptile part of the brain that uh, that this needs to survive whenever that that happens, and so people get kind of dumb and they do dumb things whenever whenever that happens. But uh, you're uh, uh, so if you can learn to control which part of your brain is getting the juice, then you will be less susceptible to going into freak out mode under pressure. So there's 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 that. So it's it's a uh, so you know these these are are tangible benefits from learning how to control your nervous system. Mm. <laughs> that that's a big smile there, Keith. Yes, good. <laughs> Very subtle. Okay, moving on. Producer says moving on. Okay, so next thing um, was um, da, 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 what was the other thing that shoulders? we did before the shoulders. There's one other thing. Lifting the sky, wishing the moon. Okay, that was it. Is that it? Okay, that, I'm gonna do that as part of the shoulder thing. Okay, so we're gonna move on to uh, to shoulders because it's something that is uh, um, near and dear to my heart. I've I've abused my shoulders many many times over these seventy years, and uh, I have been you know looking to to continue to be able to play hard. Uh, and uh, but not feel the the pain of of you know shoulders deteriorating. So uh, I've been working and and studying it, uh, about this for uh, decades actually, and developed a number of exercises to uh, to help. Going back in oh, about twenty five years ago, I came up with a a series of exercises to rehabilitate my shoulders then. And it's a continuing thing because I like I still like to play tennis and I like to you know hit the ball very hard and uh, and each time I do that it sends a shock wave to my shoulders and and it says ow oh, but that uh, uh, the learning how to do it more gracefully as I as I age is uh, I think an important part of that and also to be able to rehabilitate uh, my shoulders and find those things that I'm doing wrong 
and be able to share them with other people because maybe somebody else is doing it wrong too. So um, one of the biggest awarenesses that I've come up with regarding this is it's, it's kind of really simple and it's probably something that somebody somewhere has written about, but I haven't seen it yet. And that is the effect of posture on your shoulder function. And since one of the characteristic things of, uh, that I notice in a lot of people, and you may too, is, is the tendency, particularly in the age of computers and the like, is to kind of, the shoulders to kind of move forward as, as we get older. And there's a, a kind of a hunching in the back and, and uh, this kind of thing as we get, uh, it gets more pronounced as, as we age. And the, part of the problem is that it's, it's done usually to avoid feeling bad whenever one is opened up. And so one tends to get more and more into this tiny little box that creates problems. But uh, the uh, observation that I made is that uh, if you have your shoulders rotated forward slightly, then you bring your arms up like this and just feel into that. And notice as you open up here, there is resistance that you encounter from your muscles, from your body, from your joints, you know, by just opening up like that and you come back and just, and just feel that again, you're rotating your shoulders forward. And, you know, even if your, your body's just slightly hunched forward and you try to open that up there, notice there's a point, I get it about right here where I start to notice there's a drag on that. And I have to overcome, I have to use my force to kind of, uh, kind of push on through that, right? But uh, if I were to reach from the crown of my head, open the jade pillow gate and open the chest. And now if I do that, there is no resistance. It's just wide open. It just, oh, that, that's easy. And then just try it again and do it with the shoulders. Just kind of allow yourself to slump a little bit and then try it again. And just notice that there is, there's drag on that. And we usually have a couple of solutions to that. We either just reduce our activity so that we don't hurt. So we just get, you know, more and more slumpy or we force our way through it. And, uh, you know, we'll just kind of keep pounding away until it, uh, it, it uh, just wears out because what's happening is that it's actually a fairly recent discovery that there is a, a joint in your body called the uh, uh, acromiohumeral joint, which is it's where the humerus, the uh, upper arm, enters into the into the shoulder, and there's a a very slight uh, clearance between that and the acromion, which is this bone that goes across here. So it's sort of the counterpart to your clavicle, which goes across the front here. And so this thing goes across there. That's your acromion. And then there's a joint there and where the humerus goes up into that. There's a, uh, uh, an arch there. And if that, that gap is too narrow, then it scrapes against the tendon which causes tendonitis, causes an inflammation of that joint. And so then, you know, you, if you then use your, your rotator cuff muscles to try to kind of push on through that, they get irritated as well. And they kind of wear out and you get these micro fractures in the, uh, in the and micro tears in, in, the, uh, in the muscles there as well. And so it creates a lot of problems, which then creates pain which then if we don't know what's going on, we just tend to, to you know, solidify rather than to open up. So opening up that, that acromiohumeral joint um, 
is a really important, important thing. And uh, there are a number of exercises you can do. And most of the focus in, in physical therapy and whatnot is on musculature. It's on how to, how to build up the muscles so that you can, uh, you can compensate for, for the fact that most of your energy is going forward like that, right? Very little of it's going back like that. So it's, you know, we tend to be forward, forward, forward like this and tends to collapse everything. The muscles in front get overdeveloped and the muscles in back get underdeveloped. And so we get, we tend to shrivel up. So that's the, the primary focus and it's a good focus. And it's something I encourage as well. The one thing that you can, uh, you can do that will create space in this, in this joint that is, is hang. You just grab a, a, a like a, a bar and you just kind of hang from that and allow your body to, to relax and just allow it to pull on that, that joint. You do it like for a minute at a time. And that allow, it, it starts to create space there in your joint, which is, which is really cool. And, and think that there are other exercises you can do, which, which help also. Um, but what I say, uh, if you don't correct the cause, what I believe to be the cause, you're probably going to run through the same thing again. And that is, if you are not correcting your posture, if you're, if you're sitting like this, you're standing, you know, like this, and you're, you in that, then you are going to continue to narrow that, that joint. So the, a lot of things we've been discussing, that is lifting with the crown, opening the jade pillow gate, tucking it to the chin, opening the shoulders, the back, and, and getting that kind of upright posture has the effect of taking the strain off of those joints. And, um, and so we can then learn to use the joint and here is where I'm going to kind of make the bridge into Taiji Chuan. Use it like the qua. Okay, so, and, and, and the qua is, is, even though it's surrounded by some of the strongest muscles in the body, itself is defined by its, um, its non-stuff. It's the fact that it's a, it's a yin emptiness there rather than, than something. So there's, and, and when you're, you're sung kwa, there is, you're feeling the support in the surrounding area, but the kwa itself is like empty. And you want to get that same kind of feeling with your, with your shoulder joints. You want to get that feeling of, of emptiness. And, and very similarly to the way we support the kwa to allow it to get to feel empty, to be able to, to relax and let go of that, that hip tension, is we, we do it by setting the knee. We establish a position with the knee, and that allows us to, oh, good. Body says, I can relax now. I can let go. I can get some kwa. Similarly, we use the elbow to establish position so that we can then release the shoulder. So there are eight gates, eight energy gates that uh, they talk about in the Taiji classics. And they're called the Bamen. And, uh, and these are different movements or postures or martial applications that uh, are considered to be essential and, and create the identity of Taiji as, as, as a thing, right? This is what, you know, these are the things that are involved with that. And it's, uh, you know, they ward off or Pong energy, that expansive energy or Lu energy, which is kind of a down and in kind of energy. It's a, it's a very yin receptive energy and G energy, which is press which is which is a kind of a exaggerated yang going in like in two different directions kind of a, a force going out and or uh, then on energy which is often translated as push but it's it's more of a energy is a is a down and out it's kind of a wave form whoosh like that 
And those are like the four primary gates. And so you can see that each of them is like an application. It's, it's a way of moving. It's a body position, but it's also an energy. There's also a characteristic quality to that so that so much so that you if once you tap into the energy you do not have to do anything gross on a physical level to manifest that energy you can just make it happen and it it's it it gets spooky how much that goes so it's it there's an energy behind it a chin that enables that those actions to go so there is there are different ways of, of thinking about these these gates, but the uh, um, the one that we're we're interested in, in in this discussion is we're kind of moving into the very insubstantial level, and that is of of these things as energies, not just martial techniques. So then we go to the the next four, and that is where we have pluck, which is which is a very uh, abrupt downward motion. And it's kind of a little like a, uh, like a, a loo, but it's, it's much more, boom, it's, it's more abrupt. And uh, then there's split energy, which is, which is you're feeling like you're, mm, you're pulling taffy, you're, you're separating out. So that, that, whoa. And it's like, it's not just, oh, this force is going this way, it's this force going, it's the, the two of them together have this, uh, another name for it is a rend, you know, split or rend. And there's a, there's a pulling, you can see, see that particularly like, say, in a, like a diagonal flying or a, a high pad on horse kind of posture where you're, mm, the both arms are moving in opposite directions. So there is a, there's a, a splitting energy there. And then there's one that is, um, uh, the one we've been focusing on a lot over the last year or so is elbow gin or Joe. And that is, it, it's off, usually th thought of as like an elbow strike, which is, is kind of unsatisfying to me. I like to prefer to think of it as, as the energy that organizes the whole system whenever you, whenever you do that. So we're getting now to the last of them, which is cow, which is shoulder. And that is the gin associated with that. And it's the toughest to nail down because it's usually translated as a shoulder strike. So you're banging into somebody with your shoulder, which again, is not really that satisfying to me as a, as a, you know, as a refined kind of quality. And um, another way of translating is lean. So there's like, you're kind of, oh, you're, you're, you're using your body mass to, to kind of insinuate yourself onto someone else. And it's also kind of, yes, that you can, I can see that, but there's more, there's another thing which is, and we're getting to really insubstantial now, and that is if we are emptying out the shoulders and we're really attuning to the insubstantiality, the, the less is more quality of it. Then we get cow as shoulder gin, which is coming, it's that which unifies the whole system. So like in the Tao Te Ching, they say that the usefulness of a cup is, comes from the emptiness in the cup. So the, that is this to me, if I'm reading this right, and I might not be, but I'm, I'm saying this is my, 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 my thinking on this is that we are moving, and when we get it to shoulder chin, it's not just like banging somebody with your shoulder or trying to knock down a door with a shoulder. It's Kyle as this insubstantiality that unifies the whole system into non-stuff, which then allows the stuff to to become even more powerful. And that is there. So this is taking the very simple stuff that I'm talking about, the very practical idea of, of getting rid of shoulder pain and, and which is really cool. And, and, but the pain is just sort of an indicator that, hey, Rick, you're doing something wrong. And uh, so I kind of you know, have that as my, uh, 
my barometer there is like, okay, if I'm feeling shoulder pain, I'm doing something wrong. So I had to kind of find out what it is that is causing my body to hurt itself. So whenever we're taking, going beyond that and into the very insubstantial realm of Taiji Tran, and how do we make this into a really cool thing that, that works? So let's do a few exercises where we're really going to focus on the elbow or the uh, shoulder chin. And let's, uh, let's move on that because we're um, doing a lot of talking. Here we go. So let's begin with your uh, uh, step out, feel the balls of your feet. Get your three pillars in. So you're feeling the balls of your feet, knees are unlocked, reach with the crown of your head, open the jade pillow gate. Relax your lower back and allow your sacrum to drop. Feel, feel a, you're separating your poles in opposition. You have the poles in opposition between your Wei Lu and the at the coccyx and the knee one point at the uh, at, at, at the crown of the head and feel your spine lengthening. Reach with your elbows and relax your shoulders, allow them to empty out. Point your index fingers and just get, feel your quad nice and relaxed. Now, as we do these exercises, we've done them before, but we're going to, this time, the focus is on really emptying out the shoulders and activating. And each time, this is something we've also discussed before, but I'll just reiterate it now, and that is we're going to activate sequentially so that the shoulder is not the initiator of the movement, but it's the last thing to come online. So we're gonna begin with um, uh, lifting the sky. So exhale, relax, inhale, bring your hands up, feel your fingers, your wrists, your elbows. And reach. So you're not pushing your hands up with your shoulders, but you're pulling your arms up with your fingers. Feel your lengthening there. Your hands are, are palms up. Elbows are reaching out. And your Hold your breath there for a second and then exhale as you come down. And here, as you're coming down, reach with your elbows, reach with your wrists, reach with your fingers. Continue to reach with the crown of your head. Inhale. Point, reach, open the joints and just feel like your fingers are pulling your arms, they're lengthening your arms and then exhale. Inhale. Sink. Hold your breath. Exhale, reach with your elbows, your wrists, relax your shoulders and allow your shoulders to be pulled by your arms. Inhale, point, reach open, feel the space in your fingers, your wrists, your elbows, your shoulders. 
Feel the space in your vertebrae as you reach up with the crown of your head. And exhale. Inhale. Hold. What muscle, muscular tension can you release and lift the sky? And exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Relax and just feel into your body. Feel the energy circulating throughout. Now embracing the moon. Exhale, bow, hands come down. Inhale, come up, reach out, relax your shoulders, reach your elbows, your wrists, your fingers, inhale. Hold, hold the moon in your hands, arch your back. Shoulders are relaxed, arms are relaxed, and exhale. As you're going down, feel the our arms lengthening. And inhale, open. Feel the space in your joints and exhale. Inhale, reach. Your arms are getting very light. Hold. Exhale. <clears throat> Inhale, point, reach, open. And relax. Just feel the energy. Allow your arms to unwind. Your shoulders, your arms, feel them unwinding. Just as you hold the shape, you're just allowing the, the energy to move through. Allow the connective tissue to unkink. Okay, now as you inhale, point your index fingers, reach with your wrists and come out to the side. And just feel very slowly each minute movement. Open your your shoulders, your chest, bring your shoulder blades a little more together and back. You're reaching out with the wrists. Feel your arms getting very long. Your hands continue to rise. Arms are very relaxed. Feel the connection from your fingers all the way down through your feet and into the earth. And meet. And bend your knees, sink. And as you do that, reach up, open, and extend. Exhale and separate. Move down. You're coming down. Notice if you reach with your elbows, it's easier 
to, to support your arms effortlessly and to let your shoulders relax. Point, reach, open the joints. Feel your arms getting longer. As if someone were pulling on your fingertips. Feeling the connective tissue lengthening. You're reaching down with your fingers, reaching up with the crown of your head. Relax. Step in. Take a deep breath. Feel your arms very relaxed, floating up. Exhale, disappear the chi. Grab a seat, please. Hey. How'd that feel? Good, 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 good. All right. Any questions, thoughts? Richard. So it seems like it's helpful um, to have your shoulders, I would call it a little externally rotated instead of inter. It seems like we've, or I anyway, have always put my shoulders like this. Right. Uh, and and it seems to really help to, like we were talking about last week, to open this up and right. rotate externally instead of internally. Um, that seems so. It seems so strange that I've never tried that. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, funny, and even in, even in the Taiji community, you know, where there, there's a sort of a, an idea that got picked up, and I. I I think it's just a bad translation. The idea that you should round the shoulders and sink the chest, you know, and uh, and that was like one of these ideas that we we had. It's like no, no, don't do that. <laughs> That's bad, and uh, you know, it, it, there's nothing good about that. So, but to yes, Sharon. Now I have a question. I'm not sure yes. if it's per pertinent here or not. Um, I've heard the term in Tai Chi um, about floating the collarbone. Floating and the collarbone. Floating the collarbone. And I don't know how to do that. I've never heard that expression. Okay. There is one thing that I, I, I have used in the past, and it's still valid, but although I rarely think to, to actually mention it, and that is to feel though you're lifting from the clavicular notch. Mm -hmm. So as if a string were pulling up, so you're going up like this rather than down like that, right? So you're, oh, you're, mm. and I kind of, if you can feel it, this actually tests out really well whenever you do it, you actually enhance your effective power. If you're, so rather than like this, you're, you're someone is lifting you up by the clavicular notch and opening, and it kind of opens your chest and your shoulders kind of like a flower. Yeah, Valerie. Um, you know, I've always heard lift from the back. How does that play in with lift from the clavicular, clavicular notch and lift from the back? I mean, I think I can feel doing both without 
doing this to lift the back. Um, do you understand what I'm saying? I, 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 I understand the, the words. Uh, I do not know how that would be beneficial. Okay. So I, I you know, uh, please ex uh, investigate for me, please, and, and, and give me a report. Uh, I, I don't know how that would be beneficial because anything that would be pulling up from here would cause me to, to hunch forward, I would think, you know, and that's not where I want to, I want to come up from my center line to lift from my, you know, from my crown, which will be then over my, uh, the balls of my feet. And so I'm able to find that center equilibrium. Yeah. Well, what I feel when I do that lifting from the back is I feel the knee one engaging. Okay, so that's happening. And if I lift from the clavicular notch, it's kind of like both sides coming together, going up. Cool, something to, uh, to ex explore there. So thank you. Scott, you had something? Um, yeah, well, just uh, to answer Sharon's question, or at least my theory on that is, if you know, if I'm doing this where I'm just, you know, moving and I'm not engaging the shoulder, and I'm moving, you know, with my, you know, elbow gin and everything else. Feels to me like the, the collarbone is floating. Okay, cool. Yeah, you know? cool. Good, good. So maybe that's what they're talking about. Maybe I, 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 I never. It's <laughs> not an image that, that communicates to me yet, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah, it just kind of feels like it's floating around in there if you just move your arm gently, gently, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> It just kind of feels like it's floating around in there. Okay, cool, cool. Maybe that's what they're talking about. Lynn. Oh, just a thought in response to Richard's, you know, or to your comment about, you know, whatever, hunching the shoulders or dropping the chest, sinking the chest, right? And I sometimes think it might be the reaction to the old fashioned shoulders back, you know, right. chest up military position, right? right? We, and so it's kind of a counter like from here, you should sink the chest, but you shouldn't, you know, crouch. Yeah. So yes, I, I mean, I, I can think of ways to make it useful. <laughs> but, right. Point taken. But it, it's a you know, I, I think we may me. we may have overcorrected there. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Anybody else? Uh, Okay, great. Thank you all so much. Oh, Sharon, you have one more thing? You're on mute. No, I've right. just been playing with lifting the clavicular notch, and uh -huh. I have a lot more space for my organs. Yes. It's a total, di a total different awareness, and it's very different than lifting yeah. to the back for me. Yes. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, check these things out and report back. Keith, you have one thing? You have to, you're on, you're on mute, Kate. You're on mute. That was an awesome session, and I'll see you in Pennsylvania on Friday, my friend. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Music and merriment. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Great. Love you all. <laughs> bye bye. 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 Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Maria. A late happy, happy birthday, birthday, Maria. Thank you. Oh, shall we sing?